talk about LAS 2.0. And for those of you who are familiar with LAS, I'll give an overview. And then uh, the components of LAS 2.0 are the VMware Cloud Foundry and uh, Toad. And so I'll talk a little bit about VMware Cloud and then uh, do a demo of Toad. So what is Glass? Uh, Glass is a platform for deploying web-based small talk applications on uh, Gemstone S. Uh, the basic idea is to develop in uh, Squeak and Faro and deploy in Gemstone. Uh, in support of that, we have uh, on the browser-based development tools as part of Glass, a compatibility layer on top of the standard Gemstone uh, library, and many of the popular uh, Squeak and Faro projects have been ported to Gemstone S. Um, why use Glass? Well, Gemstone S is a high-performance, high-reliability uh, alternative when your web application outgrows a single VM. So when it's time to move your, your, your application up to more than one, one small talk VM, it's time to start considering Glass as an option. Uh, with the transparent persistence and transparent concurrency features of Glass, you can add this, uh, uh, you can scale to multiple VMs without having to change, make up changes to your application code. And Glass is free for commercial use. Um, when I talk about transparent persistence, what I'm talking about is that Gemstone uses the same persistence model that's used in Squeak and Faro. So uh, um, objects rooted in Smalltalk are considered persistent in Gemstone as just as they are when you save your image in Squeak or Faro. Um, and but, uh, the difference is that Gemstone uses transactions instead of saved image. Yeah. And uh, for a commit, the changed objects in a VM are saved to the repository. And for an abort, the entire object graph is updated to the current view, dropping any of the changed objects on the floor. Um, so uh, because there's that extra transaction logic, what we have done is embedded the, trans the transactions in the web frameworks. So your application doesn't have to have any special code for Gemstone. Um, Basically, for the web apps, we have a board set, we have a board when an HTTP request comes in. So there's a fresh view in the in the, uh, in the VM, and then uh, processing goes on, and then we do a commit before the HTTP request is returned. So basically, we have a fresh view at the start, and any changes that were made during the processing of the request are saved to the to the repository. So yeah, and no application level code needs to be changed, and you're getting persistence out of the Transparent concurrency. Uh, on a commit, uh, Gemstone merges the changes to an object graph with the latest view in the repository. If two VMs have concurrently updated the same object, a commit conflict is thrown. And again, that commit conflict code is embedded in the framework, not in your application. And when an HTTP request, when there's a conflict, the HTTP request is retried. So basically what happens is two requests come in at the same time, one finishes before the other and finishes its commit. They're both trying to buy shoes or something like that. Um, and they both buy the same shoe out of the list. Only a commit conflict will occur for the second one in. Instead of having special logic to say, well, let's try again inside, let's just abort, restart the, the HTTP request, and process it again. You know, if the last shoe is sold, your logic says no shoes available. Sorry. Um, so again, you can have this uh, conflict detection uh, trans uh, transparent without any application changes. Um, so uh, going on to the, the Cloud Foundry, um, the Cloud Foundry is from VM, VMware, and it's a platform for building and deploying and running cloud-based applications. So cloudfoundry.com is a complete hosted environment from VMware, offered by VMware, and cloudfoundry.org is an open source project for managing that stuff. Um, in terms of Glass, we are actively integrating Gemstone S and Maglev into the Cloud Foundry framework. So our plans are to include support for Seaside, AIDA, Iliad, and Peer. And then when we're finished, we'll have a cloud-based hosting service for Glass. And this will make deploying uh, applications of Gemstone S even easier. Um, now I'll start talking about Toad. Um, and that's the uh, Toad stands for the object-centric development environment. <laughs> it's like Gemstone Soup, it's just a small the, the, the V. Um, so right now, um, Toad is a proof of concept um, for a small talk ID that runs an IDE that runs in a web browser. It's written in Seaside, it's been ported, ported to Gemstone and Seaside, uh, Faro and Gemstone, 
and it's got an MIT license. And um, basically, there's a small but powerful framework for uh, you know, de developing your code apps uh, that's easy to customize, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, why did I do Toad? Well, Toad was created to provide the Smalltalk ID for deployed web applications. Um, the traditional Smalltalk GUI is too slow when you use it across the LAN, and in many cases, you have limited access to the machines that are running your, your Smalltalk application or your Smalltalk web app. And in the case of the Cloud Foundry, there's only HTTP access. No, you can't touch the machines themselves. So the only option for doing Smalltalk is through HTTP. And Smalltalk without an ID, Smalltalk anymore. So, um, so basically, um, in looking at Toad and thinking about how I was going to you know, put a development environment into the into the web, um, yeah, what I didn't want to do was try to duplicate the traditional environments. I, you know, the, the real answer there was it's just too much. I thought it was too much work. You know, do I do I port Morphic to Seaside so that you know so. You know, um, so I didn't think that that was a good idea, and I didn't think that traditional tool, Windows-based tools, was going to work in the web. So I noodled around a little bit and came up with, you know, this original idea, <laughs> basically, you know, modeling uh, uh, Toad as an image browser in your web browser. So it's like using the internet, except we're we're, we're now traversing your image, uh, and URL is a small talk expression. Links are following object references. History is a stack of object references. A page is a set of tabbed panes for an object, and a pane contains a rendered aspect of the object. So basically, it's you know, you know, it's the hypertext for small talk. Uh, is this this way? This way. I want to just give you a navigation, a view of uh, an overview of the of the Toad um, page. Um, to start with, at the top, there's a navigation pane. This is where you type in uh, your URL or your small talk expression. There's a back button there, uh, search, etc. Now, um, one of the things I want to comment here is uh, this is proof of concept. So if it's not pretty, you know, I mean, I didn't make, I didn't make it ugly on purpose. But then, if I try to make it pretty, I don't think it, you know, it might look just like this. So, <laughs> so anyway, you know, but I have a back button. It doesn't look like one. Um, this is the frame pane, and this is where all the action is. And this is uh, basically you have a collection of tabs, and you select a tab to view an aspect of the object. I've got basically a view, help, inspect, class, and method are the standard aspects for an object. And then inside the pane, to control the contents of a single pane, uh, that is drawn by a renderer, and the renderer is derived from a uh, specification and a fragment. So, that, so what we're doing is if we back up and say I'm I'm looking I'm navigating to an object and I'm viewing an aspect of that object I have a pragma somewhere in the class super high, uh, su uh, super class chain telling me how to render this aspect for that object um, and that's that's it I mean this is the frame I mean uh, you know this is the framework this is it there's not much else going on here and uh, I've got a sidebar pane for lists. All right, um, and then at the bottom is a history pane for directly navigating through history besides using the back button. So now I'll go take us into, into Toad and I'll try to try to show off some of these features. Now is that going to be big enough for everybody to see? Yeah. Okay. These are my demo glasses. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by uh, just jumping into a very simple object. I'm going to type in object new. I'm going to type object new into the uh, navigation pane at the top here and hit return. And what happens is you uh, open an inspection tab on the object, the result of the expression. And we're looking at it's an object and it's class is object. If we look at the view tab, uh, it's the print string for the object, obviously. If we look at the help tab, this is the class comment for the object. 
Um, I've seen them inspect. If I look at the class tab, um, a couple things I want to point out. Obviously, we've got the class definition down here. But um, if you notice, I've got solid links and uh, dashed links. All right? The solid links navigate to other objects. The dashed links navigate within, you know, basically are doing uh, JavaScript and redisplaying the DOM, changing the DOM without, without affecting the object. So, uh, or the, the, the current object. So if we're, if we're looking at an object and I select proto object here, all right, you notice it changes the proto object. We're actually viewing that class, we're on that instance. If I press the back button, we come back to object again. Um, if I sit down and click on the dotted line proto object, I'm still in an object, but I'm now viewing the class definition for proto object. So this gives you the ability to basically sit on an instance and then navigate the superclass hierarchy without losing your context. And uh, I'll come back to this later in, a, in another example to give you some, uh, uh, you know, some more information about it. Um, this class explorer, I have a class definition, which is an editable class definition you all recognize, and then new class template and subclass. But the, the, the class explorer has links. So if I click on the category, for example, I now go to the classes that are in that category. And this is just an example of you know, what are you going to do when you navigate? And uh, uh, you know, that's the in in interesting information here. Um, it's all back up here. Yeah. Um, what I want to do now is, oh, I go to the methods, yes. So I'm going to go to the methods and show you basically what, how the code was working. Um, you can go to the object class, the toad core, and look at the toad view tab spec. So this is the magic pragma that if you put into a method will claim to return a tab spec, which defines the label for the, for the, um, for the tab and um, the receiver or renderer and uh, the method that you send to the renderer to, get, to display the tab contents. So we've got uh, render view content spec main, I'll go over here and click on the method it redirects to the render view content on renderer by default this cell. So I'll go to the render view content, and here we've got you know, pre-formatted print string, and that's what you see when you click on the, on the view tab. Um, if I want to modify that and uh, make some changes, we'll put in here a, uh, let's see. We'll put a Java world in here. I can't even misspell hello correctly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's say we'll click on the uh, view. So basically, you can see uh, that's really that's relatively simple. What you notice I was I was actually typing in seaside HTML. Anything that you can put do in seaside, you can put there. So you can do some fairly complex displays in that pane, and it's relatively cheap to hang this into the framework. You just stick in a, 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 a a fragment and you're off to the races. Um, let's see, what I'm going to do now is take you to another, um, a little more interesting example. Um, we'll do a WA counter new. And so now we're inspecting an instance of a WA counter. Um, and you'll notice that uh, you've got your state and count is zero. But there's a Seaside tab that shows up. If I click on the Seaside tab, I'm showing the, the component that you're inspecting. So you can come over here and click your, um, you know, click your, your increment button, and then go back to the inspect, and sure enough, I've got a seven here, and that's the value that I'm looking at. So, you know, this is, you know, some convenience method. And I, I've not spent a lot of time thinking about what would be really convenient for a seaside guy, but this is kind of gives you an idea. And this is not just, you know, a limited to a seaside being able to add things like this. You can add this for other classes, your own model classes that you might have interesting things that you want to look at while you're debugging, so um, you could add your own, own, own uh, frame or uh, panes for that. Uh, the other thing is, is up in the navigation bar, you saw I was typing some expressions. The context is the object that you're looking at. So we're in the count, um, in the seaside guy here, so I can change the value of the count instance variable. Well, I'm going to go back and we inspect the results, so let's use the back button, and now we're sitting at 100 and looking at the inspector, and you know, oh, it works, amazing. Um, <laughs> Um, so the other thing that, I, that I've done for Seaside is gone over to the help 
the health team, and I've added in links um, to uh, the seaside documentation. I'm oh, good at doing internet stuff. Um, and so basically, uh, the notion here is you've got the health pain, it's there, it's supposed to be there for everything. If you've got information that can be useful for the person developing in that or yourself, stick it in the health pain. And in fact, the interesting, the neat thing here is one of the things that happens is um, external documentation and internal documentation can get out of sync. Well, now you can basically embed your, you know, your external documentation, uh, you know, in the internal documentation. Uh, but um, and then finally, I'll go over. Okay, so we, you know, so that I think that's interesting. Another another one that, that I think would be really interesting, oops, um, is uh, if you sat down and had a little expression that went off and it hit the bug system and said, "What known bugs are there for this class in this version of the system that I'm, that I'm programming in?" All right, and or other things. All right. So again, you know, this this is the type of stuff when you when you bring your environment out to the web. You know, I think you get to have some of these things going on. I think this could be done. Not, I'll get to that. In a little, you know, I hope I'll remember to get back to that. Remind me if I don't about uh, you know the thoughts of it. It's not on the web. Uh, like what do you do? And finally, I want to show for the VBA counter um, the view. So I, view in code is the print string, all right? But the print string is really a, a window. And so I've got a link here and a, and a button. And the button that sends initialize to the class. And when I click on the view component, it opens. The component in the C site in the browser window. So again, you know, things may behave differently. You want to look at that. Um, and of course, you can click on this guy, and then come back to uh, where you started from with the inspector. You know, we're, it's the same instance that we're working on here. This is one of the things I, you know, I'm using C site here, but I'm not really taking advantage of a lot of C site. You know, there's a very thin layer of C site, and then you hit the image. So the state that you're displaying up here is image state. It's not any. There's no. There, you know, the Toad framework is sitting here with a small object that sits between the, the component and the object under inspection, all right? And it just manages the list of tabs. It's called the frame, the list of tabs, and what the, what the, what the renderers are. And so everything else is image, is image state. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is basically show you uh, the implementation of a couple of these methods. Um, and again, now you get a, a chance to see kind of uh, uh, what the hierarchy, navigating the hierarchy from here will look like. So I'm in WA Counter, and here's the list of methods, and I don't see anything that looks like a fragment or for code. Um, and I, I, I happen to know that up in WA Component there is some, so we'll just navigate there directly. And so here's the Toad Seaside tab spec. Right? This is defines what the contents of the um, uh, the Seaside pane or t uh, pane is. And it says, send the message, read the seaside tab on. So if we take a look at that, it's a pretty, you know, self rendered content on this standard display your component in a, in a pane. Um, for the help tab, I just stuck in some pop-up anchors that uh, went off and hit Earl from, uh, from Seaside. So, uh, you know, straightforward stuff there, view content, same thing. You know, simple little, um, little render, rendering methods that, you know, are very useful. All right. Okay, uh, so I, I said there was an image browser, and we've kind of navigated around some objects. But now, one of the one of the neat things is being able to go to uh, the, the explorer uh, and navigate around in your uh, uh, you know via the explorer. So there's there's a class explorer, and if I click on the count uh, instance variable, I get the references to the count instance variable, and I can poke around here. I can look at the method decrease. Um, and work my way through the list of methods, looking at them and going, this is the one I was looking for. Um, let me look at the uh, implementers of Anchor. Well, I've already got the implementers clicked on, so I'll click on Anchor. Oh, the WHTML canvas, that's the guy. Oh, there's the uh, Anchor tag class. I want to look it up. We'll click on that guy. Um, okay, I'm in this method, in this class, and I'm really looking for the width method, so I'll scroll down here. Should have a be able to type that that's this is a proof, this is a proof of concept. Um, all right, so I've got the width method, and if I look at the width method, I'm following super down here in the method. And if I look up at the protocol, at the, um, the, the super class, you notice I've got some guys that aren't bold. What that means is there's a method, you've got a selected method width. Width is also implemented in WA tag brush and WA brush. 
So if I click on WA Tag Brush, it takes me up to the lift method in the super class. I click on WA Brush, it takes me up again. All right? um, and then uh, for uh, kind of heading towards the finale, which is really good. Um, I'm going to do uh, senders of width. There's a lot. So we've got this long, long list of senders. It's like send, doing senders of that foot, but that foot would be a bigger list. So you've got this long list, and I don't know if you've ever done that, and then like, okay, now how am I going to do What am I going to do? Uh, I just like the bullet starts. Well, this is small talk, right? Right? What do you do when you have a list? You do a select statement, all right? So I do a self select. Now I know that these are method references, and if we look at this, we can see that. That's why I need to switch glasses. But you got to let it when a mistake happen. Oh, I see. That was the demo. Yes. Uh, so I can send actual class to the method reference with the name and use with. And oh, see, I've seen it. Okay, I got a debugger. You can play it. It's a different error. So I got a debugger, all right? And, um, you know, I think the point is to show you that I, that, that I hit a debugger. I can look at the exception itself and inspect it. I can come back here, look at the frames, um, see the methods. I've got the args, I've got the method context, and so on. Standard debugging things. So uh, this is not a live debugger, so I'm not going to proceed. Um, so it's become more of a uh, stack inspector. But again, um, you know, one of the interesting things in doing this in, in Seaside is, uh, yeah, yes. The, the context up there is actually the stack context, right? So you could evaluate in the context of that phrase. Yeah, yeah. The problem, well, there was, well, I had one issue that, or a couple issues, was that the process that's running, that I'm inspecting here, is also displaying Seaside. And so if I go ahead and stop that son of a gun, then you don't get to see what I stopped. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a solvable problem, all right? But basically, I think it's a harder problem than I wanted to solve for the proof of concept. So, and, you know, I've done some tricks in the evaluation and the navigation pane of forking out the process so I can proceed. But, you know, so there's, there's definitely, this is, you know, you know, this is one of the areas that, that I need to look at. Um, but anyway, so you can poke around in here. we got the debugger. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to our senders of width. And I'll, type, I'll try to type it correctly this time. But I did do this, so I don't have to type it again. Oh my goodness, I really did it back in there, didn't I? <laughs> there we go. So um, I inspect now the result, but if I click on the view, um, what I get is, OK, it's only the Seaside classes, but they're still. All right, so let's, I'll look at one more, one more of these. Um, so, uh, actually, I can just do it. And now we got um, to the, you know, you know, a couple expressions and we're there. Oh, uh, inspector, okay. But anyway, we got down to, we got back to that. So that's that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make is that trying to stay close to the objects in here. You know, I didn't have to do very much special monkey business to get to the point of being able to evaluate expressions. Um, some things I can look at here. I've got a workspace associated with frames, so you can associate workspace variables there. But I really think. You know, as I go through this, that a workspace is something where you want to create a pane and put some buttons on it and some input fields, all right? And allow you to essentially have a richer workspace experience and, you know, as part of the, as part of the, 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 the interface. Um, that's, you know, I don't know if I emphasize it enough or, you know, because that's kind of the idea here is, you know, it's really easy to add stuff 
to your development environment now. Because there is no, you don't have to go find out which tool am I using, which window is it, how do I add the thing that I want to add to that guy, oh, and this guy, and oh, that guy, and this guy, and all distributed out. Because you've got the object, and that's the thing you're interested in, and the tools are sitting around the object, all right, as opposed to being, you know, district, you know, separate tools looking at and having to navigate to the object. So um, I'm gonna, I was going to go quickly go in and do a so and show a search. Um, so I do have search, so I can type in and uh, you know, find a class. Um, I've got implementers um, exact and implementers where I can say, give me the uh, oops, give me the selector, the implementers that have main colon as part of their selector. I guess there are a few. Anyway, that allows you to, you know, I've always wanted to do something like that in the development mode. Because I know parts of, this, parts of the name, but not the whole name. I want to look at the implementer too. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that's, that, that, I think I, I'm done with the demo here. So, uh, let's go back to the application. And what I want to say is I think this is a successful proof of concept. You know, I think there are some very interesting ideas. Um, most of the development environment, I think most of the pieces that you need, I, I had a piece of it. I, I left off, I probably implemented 75% of the tools um, in this. Um, and half of those are kind of clunky that they're there, all right? But that's, you know, a little spit and polish, a little bit of work, and I'm going to re-architect at least one more time because um, I've learned some things this round. This is actually round two. Uh, of trying to do this, um, and so, uh, but I think it's a simple, it's a simple idea, and it's a simple framework. Um, what I, what I, you know, some of the challenges there is this is using Seaside, and you know, nothing against Seaside, but you know, I would, you know, if you're running with Iliad or you're uh, developing an IDA, you want to load Seaside in order to have a development, a remote development environment, and the answer is, well, now you don't have to, right? So. Or, so there's a couple different things here that what, what needs to happen, or what, what Toad needs is a, a neutral rendering language, all right? A way to write, uh, you know, uh, uh, framework independent uh, rendering code. Now, there's a couple options I think that are floating around out there. I think there's, there's Glamour as a possibility. It has mappings to multiple things, including Morphic, which is one of the things we back up to here is, you know, if you wanted to do something in Morphic, you could. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's, I think there's an Orca. Are the guys that are doing Orca here? Um, I think they're representing tonight. Um, uh, all right, uh, come on, talk to me. Yeah. Um, basically, they're, they're doing something with what they're doing tonight because um, you know they're, they've got a small talk uh, language for uh, generating JavaScript on the client from the server. So that's kind of the, the problem that we have in this thing. Is I want to write server code. And part of that's going to run in the browser, and then it's going to call a block that executes back in the server. And that's not really a cleanly solved or generically solved problem. And finally, you know, somebody needs to make this pretty, and I, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, for the future, uh, we're going to continue work on Toad. You know, basically, uh, it's a re-architect, and then start heading for the, for an alpha release. Um, and then the, the second thing is Gemstone is for the Cloud Foundry. Um, we're, like I said, we're actively working on that, and you keep an eye out for, for, for news um, with that going on, and there's the URLs. So, thank you, and got questions? Yes, yes, sir. Now, if I have a park of VMs, 
of, of images running around, which I dream, oh, I don't know what this cloud found me, but I was feeling, oh, maybe there are 20, 50 images running somewhere right. there. Right. Do I want to have Toad running on all these ah, okay. images to sure. show that I connect to that guy because I want to run on what? Okay. Or, so Let me answer that question um, for, from a gemstone perspective, okay? Um, let me, let me just, um, I, I'm going to start, I'm going to watch gem, the gemstone and, and, and show Toad running a gemstone, but well, I'll just describe it. Um, when you have in the Cloud Foundry, if you have, you know, 50 VMs running, right, the gemstone VMs, right? with the shared object space, okay? This is currently a feature in the current class, all right? Where you have gem tools that looks up to a VM, but you've got a shared image. So any code you write in a single VM, a single place and accept, is shipped to all of the VMs. And for doing debugging in Genstone with 50 VMs, what we do is we arrange for the Seaside error handler to pick up and create a continuation that we then stick into an object block. Right, which is basically an order collection that's shared by all the VMs. And uh, the other blog entries are timestamps, so you can order them. And, and, and basically, you can bring up the debugger on that continuation and then not necessarily continue, but view the whole context in the stack. So, you, you know, that's much better than going, oh darn, I had an error. Let me go put some print statements in so I can go back and look in the print log or put, you know, or sit down and VNC into your image and try to wait through 50. Uh, debugger windows that have popped up and wonder what's going on. So that's, you know, so that's the answer for, uh, for, for the cross. Um, and the, there might have been a first part of the question here. Uh, okay. Um, the Cloud Foundry, you know, I mean, it's, it's almost been simple, and I guess I, I, I should have put one more slide up there. <laughs> okay, the, I, I, I probably have a slide. I've written thousands of slides this, uh, in the last 24 hours on this thing, so. But basically, when you deploy an application in the Cloud Foundry, all right, what you do is you say, I want to talk to this cloud. You create a user in that cloud. You sit down and say, um, I want to have use this runtime, which would be, in our case, a, a Topaz or Gemstone Smalltalk. I want to use this framework, which could be Seaside, Aida, Gilead, or Pierre. And you say, here is my source code. And then you do a push. And what that does is the Cloud Foundry takes that source code, stores it in the Cloud Foundry database, and every, um, every VM that it starts for you uses that source code to start. Now, for Gemstone, Smalltalk, and image base is you only need to do that once. So these are some of the challenges for us. Because everybody else in the world, if you've got source code that you run in your web browser, when they fire up the VM, it goes, oh, OK, I've got to read all this stuff from Fire. All right, Ruby goes, whoa, let's suck all this stuff in. So, you know, but so but that's the model that they've built. So for Gemstone, it's a little bit different. But that's basically the basic idea, is every VM that starts up is given this what they call a little droplet. And that droplet has source code that the VM want, reads. And then you've got an HTTP port that it listens on. And, and the cloud distributes the HTTP requests to all the VMs. And, uh, you know, you can then start instances, stop instances, you know, uh, shut down your app uh, and manage your app, look at logs. That's, and then, and that's it. So it like shows up on an 80, you know, 80 line screen the whole help for for the for the for the uh, command line interface uh, for 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 the cloud. All right. And the the other thing that I didn't mention is there's services. All right. So you've got services like MySQL, Redis, Gemstone, Smalltalk will be a service. And what you do is identify services that are associated now with that with that app, and then. Because it's a framework, this is the thing that if you have a framework, you know what's going on. So if you have Rails, you know where MySQL goes. In fact, the developer knows how to tell MySQL what to do. All right? In the case of Gemstone Smalltalk, we know the same thing. If you've got a web, a web app, we know what to do. You know, if it's Aida, we know Swazoo. If it's, uh, you know, if it's, if it's um, uh, Seaside, you're, pick, pick which one you want to use. But basically, we know what's going on. And for, for Gemstone, we have the persistence already nailed for you, all right? Because you don't have to worry about that. But, um, but so the, um, the services are not owned by the cloud, all right? By Cloud Foundry. So there's the, the architecture in the Cloud Foundry is there's a service gateway that allows, you know, third parties beyond VMware or whoever else is running that, that particular instance 
or uh, the cloud to uh, uh, supply services. Um, uh, so, any other questions? Yes. Part of your presentation reminded me of uh, that philosophy. Yeah. Other parts of sea breeze. Can you position your work to those two? Um, I guess you know. I, I haven't uh, so I haven't looked a lot at web velocity, so I don't so I don't know I can't so I can't comment on where the similarities or differences are, okay? Because um, I came at this kind of as a greenfield. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a comment or no? You know, I came at it kind of greenfield and, and not knowing where all the you know what everyone else had done, and I was looking for a simple solution. You know, I've done this in a couple of months to get to this point, and you know, and that was kind of what part of the proof of concept was just to say. You know, I want to keep it, it's very simple, it's, there's not a lot of, there's not framework there, you know, but, and uh, I wanted to explore hypertext mapped to the, uh, you know, image browser, and I'm not sure that anybody else does that, but maybe they do, so. Yeah. Okay, for um, the Cloud Foundry, um, you could, you know, the, the, that's the Cloud Foundry model, is basically you know, create a new version and push a new version of the software up, you know, to your application, okay? So that's the Cloud Foundry model, all right? But as a Smalltalk, when, but for Smalltalk programmers who are going to write applications in the cloud, do you want to look at log files to figure out what your bugs are? And that's what Toad is for, all right? It's basically to allow you to get your hands on the image, to get your hands on objects, and not have to live there with, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know gloves on or whatever. But not so much to do development. Right, 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 right. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. It's a development environment, but when you're in a deployed application, you know, you're going to be very, real careful about what changes you make. Yeah, yeah. It's primarily looking and debugging and trying to understand what's out there is the primary purpose. Now. No, depending on where you're deployed. I, I work from home, all right? My image is running at the office. You know, I got, I've got exactly the same problem. You know, my, my, my image is remote from where I'm working and it's a slow connection. And so I can use Toad from home and, and do use Toad from home to work on stuff. So, any questions? Yeah. What about using Toad on top of small book hub? Or small book hub? To, to actually online edit directly on the repository um, There are, you know, I mean, the, the, this starts to, you know, we start ending up with lots of possibilities, okay? And, you know, that, that's the type of things that could be done. Um, what you end up with is a kind of, you know, namespace issues and, you know, managing who's all editing what and, um, you know, for, for some, you know, to give you an idea, for doing some experiments with, with a gemstone in the cloud, all right, for example, I took peer and made it read-only so that the code was shared and all of the objects were written out to separate user globals, all right? So it kind, of, kind of the inverse was that we shared the code with everybody, but they couldn't change it, but they could each have their own development environment and make little changes in their own development environment. That's what, I mean, that's where you need to get to is, each person needs to have like own copy of what's going on in order to edit and not affect other people. So, any other questions? side that's running code will not be the same C side that you run. We'll use a separate, you know, separate symbol dictionary, separate code base, it'll be independent and and you know for gemstone type application, you know, we can do that and have C side running and nothing running in the uh, you know, in the development and what we're going so you can develop the system engine with code will be that. But uh, but I think you know that, that's not, you know, Gemstone has that you know, ability to, to separate the namespaces out. And, uh, for, and so, 
in my, in my mind, is that's kind of why if you had a neutral or an independent rendering language for doing the rendering, you wouldn't necessarily have to use Seaside to do the rendering. And then, or you could use AIDA to develop in Seaside, and then you could use Ilya to develop in AIDA, you know, to basically avoid <laughs> your kind of breakpoints. So, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, I guess we're out of time. So, thank you very much. <laughs>